This is a show that brings to the forefront newsmakers, entertainers, and those making a difference in our lives and in our world. Each week is a new adventure with topics ranging from the most serious and cutting edge to the most lighthearted and entertaining. This is Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon. Greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon. This week, we have Jim Dawson. Jim Dawson has played at my father's place, and he's going to be playing there again. So we thought we'd grab him and get a little bit of like his story. So either before the show, you get all psyched up, or after the show, you go, wow, I want to hear more about this, this, this legend of rock. So welcome to our show. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us. Thank and, you, uh, Richard, for so, uh, asking me to uh, uh, come on board. All right, so this this particular show that you're doing, and again, for people in the future, this may be the past, but it's going to be uh, August 2019. You're going to be uh, doing it with Rebecca Angel. Yes. And you've had some shows with her in the past, right, at the Cutting she Room? At the Cutting Room a couple of weeks ago with Rebecca, and uh, uh, she we've known her forever. I've actually known her since she was like about 10 years old. A, a mush, a, a, a sweetheart, a total doll. Uh, uh, does kind of a light uh, jazz esque, uh, maybe with a hint of bassa uh, kind of material. Uh, writes some of her own stuff, does some of the classics. And uh, a couple of weeks ago at the cutting room, she did uh, <coughs> my arrangement of uh, the great Cindy Lauper tune, uh, Time After Time. Uh-huh. And I, I thought she killed it. She'll be there with. Uh, so yeah, we did the cutting room, and at the cut at the uh, my father's place. Good, Jim. Uh, she'll be working with her accompanist, uh, Jonah, who is, uh, just such a great guitar player. He plays like I, I never did, uh, Richard. He's just really smooth. So yeah, Rebecca and I'll be there. I think it's the first and is that a Thursday, Richard? I think. I have to check my phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know okay, these these right. things and are kind of funny seven. because, you know, without actually consulting my, uh, Cell phone. I, I don't really know much of anything. <laughs> uh, that you can put me in that camp as well. Do, so, do you remember yeah. when Sam Cook said, "You know, don't know much about history." Yep. That's because he didn't have a cell phone or Google. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very bad, Richard. All right, but up, up. Go to your room. <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> well, well, the comedians were already booked, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that 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 boom, shoot. Yeah. Exactly. But but uh, for all constant information, myfathersplace.com and jimdawson.com. Speaking of My Father's Place, you played at the old My Father's Place at Bryan Avenue, didn't you? I like to say, my brother, that the first time I played uh, that legendary room, and we'll certainly talk about Epic, uh, the stage was on the side, and I could still see the lanes where I believe the bowling alley had once been. Yes. So, yeah, I, I, I played that room 18 trillion times and really, really, really loved it. I always did well. I, 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 I say if I were to have a tombstone, it would say he was big on the island. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I always just loved Epi's Place. It was uh, first class. It was world class. It was first and world class. It was probably the room on the island. Always an uh, excellent sound. You know, as a musician and singer, you're always totally freaked out and worried about the sound. But it was always excellent. Then when they changed the stage over to the end of the room, uh, it, it was just, I, I have so many fond memories of the joint, I, I can't tell you. It used to park under the underpass. The, the aqueduct, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, come out and my car would be covered with... Uh, Pigeon, uh, uh, pigeon blessings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. They say it's good luck. <laughs> have any recordings from those days? Have they survived? That's a grand question, my brother. Do you mean Richard from the club itself? No, no. The, your your particular shows, because there are no, pl- I, there are I, plenty I, of performers. In fact, one of my friends was in Psy and the Clones, and uh, he played back in the day. And he was able to unearth some of the songs that they played way back when. I forgot who they opened for. Um, it, oh, it, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, while, while I certainly have, while I certainly have, like sort of, uh, I guess you would call them at the time, like you know, tapes? home recordings of that yeah. material, and some of it, of course, made it onto records as, as we move forward. Uh, I don't think I, uh, there was. I, I do remember one concert we did 
where it was broadcast live by what the, was what WLIR ninety two point seven. Yes, indeed. Yes. So maybe someplace in their archives they might have an actual show from there. But that's a long time ago, Richard. So I I, I kind of doubt it. You know, I'm going to actually call Peter Hederman, who's our sound guy, um, and he used to be the guy in the truck from WLIR who actually brought the sound from the club and got it out into the FM airways. So, wow. Yeah, so it was so interesting. I know, I know a few of the LIR people. You know, I know Dennis McNamara and Larry the Duck and, and the Money Maximizer and some, and of course, Epi, because Epi had a reggae show on WLIR. You yeah. Know. By the yeah. way, for, for those out there who are listening, um, uh, Ellen Goldfarb did a great movie about WLIR, and she actually was a guest on this particular show, as was Dennis McNamara and Epi and a lot of other you know, yeah, people. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, if there are any, are, are there any videos of you at from my father's place that survived? Uh, another grand question, old boy. I don't think so. When the club was at its height, the you know we didn't have cell phones, of course, and we kind of didn't have uh, video recorders either. So we would have probably had to bring in like a professional crew, and I don't ever recall that happening. Too bad, too, if I, if I can be pompous for a moment here, because there were some just wonderful shows. I, I remember once uh, doing, it might have been a solo show, uh, but I did a, uh, at, at the keyboard, uh, I, I used Four Strong Winds and the classic Heart Like a Wheel and I sort of sewed them together. It was a bit lengthy. It was maybe five, six minutes. But the audience began applauding before I was done. And uh, Richard, as an artist, that's, that, that gets good. <laughs> good, man. <laughs> Are there any still shots of those days? Or ticket there stubs? There may be. There totally may be. I, I could reach out to... Uh, <clears throat> I always feel so silly saying this. I, I could reach out to some of my fans, some of my supporters, some of my friends, uh, to see if they might have, but uh, not, well, as I think about this, I may have some backstage shots. Because I'd love to see them, and I'm, I am the one who is sort of collecting some of the memorabilia. Okay. And I'd like to include that either in the radio show videos. I'm pretty sure I can get you a digital copy of a which will be kind of dicey, of me and my band downstairs. I'm, I'm, I know I can. See, that'd be cool. I love, I love seeing the ticket stubs, the menus. The, the, you know, they're, they're, it's, a, it's amazing how much stuff is out there. If you actually go onto YouTube and you put in, like, sort of my father's place, you'd be amazed at how many recordings. I don't, I I don't, I don't know if they're bootlegs or not, but, but there's a lot of, you know, and then there were some actually, like, authorized albums. Like, I think there was Peter Tosh, Live at my father's place. Yeah, a CD. yeah, I think so too, right? Because Epi gave me a copy of that, like way back when. Did you know Steve Rosenfield? He was the house photographer uh, back in the day. And he, 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 he co-authored the book, uh, Fun and Dangerous, with Epi. By the way, for people who don't know, um, Michael Epstein, Epi, was the guy who actually started my father's place. Yes, that was and the, he's, he's and, a, uh, uh, he, he's a legend, dude. I mean, that, that's all I can say. He's he's to me he's like kind of like my older brother. <laughs> you know we hang out. You know, he, and the thing that you got to have when you're with Epi, honestly, is a tape recorder of some kind because he'll tell you the story of how he brought you know Keith Richards and reggae to Long Island, or how yeah. they invented the Long Island iced tea, or yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah. Know, when Linda Ronstadt first played the club and she ran out of songs, and and he said he was the one who suggested to her to play Heat Wave by Martha Ray and the Vandellas, and then that became like a big song for her. So you never know, you know, he'll, he'll tell you all kinds of things, and he kind of has a cell phone with almost everybody's phone number on it. He'll, he's, he'll, he's, he's, a, he's a mush man, uh, mad hatter. He is, uh, you, you would have to be to survive in his end of the business for as, for as long as he has. I haven't seen the new place. I haven't played there. This will be my first time in. Uh, but you, you, one must take their hats off to Epi because, uh, you know, he keeps showing up. You know, he could have been dead when the club was closed all those years ago. But he just keeps showing up. And as my, as my voice professor mentor once said, you want to know the secret of life? You do it 
or you don't. And Epi does it. Yeah. So uh, I admire him enormously. I hate him. I love him. I mean, you yeah. know, all of those things. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll tell you what's amazing is that I'll see them post, you know, a performer. And I'll be like, wow, you got Jim Messina? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. he's yeah. like, yeah, you know, like, like, you couldn't you get them? And I'm like, no. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> they, they, sure, I wouldn't I'm even sure get past could, like the agent's like voicemail machine. <laughs> I'm sure you could call the queen, and she would say, "Happy darling." <laughs> <laughs> no, so funny. I met someone in town today, and you know, like in the town of Roslyn, and and the, and, and I it was just it was like a local store, and it was like, oh yeah, we love Epi. I'm like, he like literally. Mm -hmm. he, I know mm -hmm. he has like four thousand Facebook friends. But I actually think that he actually really knows those 4,000 people. Yeah. I, <laughs> please. Please. <laughs> yeah. All right. So how no, did you I, get I'm from always, Colorado always, to New York? How, there's a lot of space that we got to cover. So okay, you're so from well, Colorado, right? We, we've got a minute. Yeah. Beautiful Colorado. Yeah. I, and first of all, I love Colorado. Did, so, and then you were in Joplin, Missouri, by the way. Did, do you know Eagle Pitcher Industries? Because I, I kind of had a connection to them. But we'll talk about that. But So you're in Colorado. And then how do you go to all these places and end up as, as a famous, you know, uh, musician who's endured all these years and I'll, all of I'll the give changes. You, I'll, I'll give you $5 later, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> all these changes in music and the industry and, and radio and recording. I mean, that's like a whole thing that we got to kind of get into because in, in some ways music must have been easier and harder. And all these years now, it's probably easier and harder still, but just in different ways. The because uh, I've, I've, I've been spending a lot of time on this uh, lately. Uh, we have a brand new song that uh, is very, uh, very patriotic. Uh, be, because of the background that I had, you know, being born like a you know basically a poor white kid in Oklahoma, and spending a little time in uh, Joplin, and spending time in Coffeyville, Kansas. That's the heartland, my brother, of this country. And then moving to Colorado, I was able to keep, uh, you may hand me the golden ear of corn at any time, I was able to keep the, the, the fiber uh, that ran in my, in, in my veins of the heartland of this country, the Colorado, even at that time, was like a, a, a hair more sophisticated, right? Then the next thing I know, I'm like zipped over here to the East Coast, to Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, the next thing I know, I, 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 I am off to uh, the South China Sea. Uh, the next thing I know, I, I recognize, uh, wait a minute, there's a whole lot more going on out here than, uh, than I than, 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 than I figured on. And as I began to mature, I, I really believe, Richard, that each of us, uh, whether we know it or not, have to accept our assignment. And in this particular case, with all of that stuff behind me, it, my, my assignment started to be pretty clear, which was, which was music. If we remember, remember at that time, I graduated high school in 64, so if, if, if we remember that time, you had Peter, Paul, and Mary, you had, uh, you, you had groups that were beginning to use the power of music to comment on the then current political reality. I suppose in a strange way that we could we could trace almost all forms of music all the way back to that same premise. But it became very clear to me. And so uh, after a year or so down in, uh, in, uh, in Virginia Beach, after I got out of the service, I realized that I either had to go to Los Angeles or I had to come to New York or I had to go to London. I realized that I had to go to where this is going to, again, sound corny, where the action was and, so, Nash and Nashville wasn't in gear at that time. <laughs> it it really wasn't, Richard. It was a different and dying form, which is why when it reinvented itself, you know, much later on, uh, what's his name, who I played with down in uh, down down in Nashville, uh, stranger in my house. Uh, uh, he was a, a great representation of the way that country also evolved. 
So, okay, I get up here, I do okay, I, I, I get a record deal, I work with some important people, uh, I start writing, blah, 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 and everything's cool. And in, it saved my life, Richard. In, in one way, yes, I became obsolete when the music industry uh, moved on to, like, disco and and all of the various genres we could say for today. But having accepted my assignment, which is, I believe the songs choose us. If your tube, if your radio tube is on, it's as if you're chosen. And so I got to a point where I recognized that whatever, whatever I do, Richard, musically, lyrically, performance-wise, whatever I do is between me and it. Don't ask me what the it is, Solomon. And so people could say, wow, he's adapted so well, he's hung on for so long, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I'd like to have a hit record tomorrow. The odds of that happening are... Please let's let's play the lotto. We have we have better odds, okay? But that doesn't mean that what I do is invalid. My shrink once said to me, "You're you're tying your abilities and your success to record sales. You're since you're not a household name, you think that you have failed." So I had to go through all all that to get to the point where I one day realized it's between me and it, and that's where the best work is going to come from. It is almost, if you will, a collaboration with a force that I do not understand, that I have done my best to understand, and I'm okay with that. So we have this new song that I mentioned, We Are America. I've done it twice in public now, and each time it's gotten a standing ovation. Well, I'm sure it's going to get one in Roslyn in August. Well, that is so, so therefore, my brother, that long-winded soliloquy. You accepted your assignment, right? You got a couple of kids, you're married, you got radio shows, you're happening. So far, so good. <laughs> Still on the air. <laughs> so that is, this. by the way, speaking of assignments, I have been assigned the task of taking this quick break because that's what we need to do. But please, I'm outraged, but go ahead. But please keep it locked in with Rich Solomon and Jim Dawson. We'll be right back. JimDawson.com. Hang on. We'll be right back. You're listening to a podcast from LIU Studios. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to this show on your podcast app of choice. For more of our programs or to support LIU Studios, visit WCWP.org. Hi, this is Rory Cosgrove, and you're listening to Rich Solomon on WCWP 88.1 FM. And we're back. (laughs) Okay. All right, Richard Solomon and Jim Dawson. For those just joining us, Jim is going to be playing again at my father's place. The last time he was playing at a different my father's place, but this one is still in the village of Roslyn, and he'll be with Rebecca Angel. And for more information, myfathersplace.com and jimdawson.com. So one of the things that he kind of snuck by in one of his answers was, hey, I graduated high school in 1964. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait. That was like when major music was being released all over the place. The Beatles, the Stones, the whole British invasion, folk music, Dylan, you know, uh, the Monkees. It was just, it was great, great, great music. What were you listening to? Uh, What radio stations were you listening to? What records were you buying? And where were you learning about new music? Who were your influencers? Here here becomes somewhat the comedy, old boy. I was at the Kingston Trio. I absolutely adored them. Uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary, as I have mentioned, had changed my life. Uh, When the Beatles came on, I was like, oh, that's wonderful, that's cute, blah, 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 not my cup of tea. That, you know, their first record was like, you know, you know, their first record was not Sgt. Pepper. Correct. Uh, (laughs) 
there was this grand venue. Uh, uh, there is this grand venue in Golden, Colorado, which is a bit of a schlep from where I live, but uh, we used to make it all the time, called Red Rocks. And it's this, na- uh, it's this kind of natural amphitheater. God, it is so, yeah, people, if, if there's anybody listening, look up Red Rocks. Uh, Sammy Hagar always thing. talks about, you know, playing at Red Rocks. So, yeah. Who? Sammy Hagar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, God, I wish, uh, God, it was, it, it's, it's, it's one of my bucket list uh, things, dude, but I kind of don't think the odds are too good. I'll anyway. make a couple of calls. Oh, we'll call Epi. We'll ask <laughs> yeah, Epi. Well, okay, <laughs> hey, I got this kid. <laughs> please, please. Uh, and the the wonderful music that, 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 that I saw up there, you know, we would go up at like, you know, two in the afternoon. We would schlep up coolers and, you know, that's when things are probably looser. And, uh, I remember a July Fourth concert. It, it totally and when I when I met and and did some work with Mary Travers a thousand years later, she 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 God amazing. She and I both remembered this minute. Okay, they were on stage, and you could see in the background uh, over this row of red rock, uh, you could see the skyline of Denver, which was like maybe twenty miles away or something. And, you know, at the time, a smaller town, but, but still a glorious uh, backdrop to a, to a, to a thing. Uh, it, but it was a July 4th concert, and <clears throat> they were in between songs. Late in the concert, they were in between songs, and uh, somebody threw a cherry bomb. Oy. Those are pretty powerful, for those who don't know. A cherry bomb, a cherry is, bomb is like is in like the league of an M80. Eight of a stick yeah. of dynamite or something. And it landed about 10 feet to, to behind them. Wow. And Mary freaked and started to run off stage. And Paul grabbed her and restrained her and shielded his body, her body, with his. I'll get emotional here, Richard. And Peter uh, spoke so softly and quietly. And there were like 15,000 people there, Richard. And that cherry bomb had shattered all of us. And then they sang Blowing in the Wind. And as they sang it, a major lightning bolt hit all the way back in Denver. And that changed my life, sir. So the music I was listening to included uh, their work, social justice work, Yes, the Beatles. Yes, I, I loved the, the, the Beatles. Please, please, the Beatles, you know. Uh, along came Mamas and Papas. Oh. When, when we got back from uh, Vietnam, the, the carrier docked. I had some friends there meeting me. I slept down the, the stairs with my, my sea bag. I threw it in the trunk. I got in, I remember the middle of the back seat, I think Decker was to my left, maybe Hearn was to my right, I'm not sure. And they turned the radio on, and the mamas and papas came on singing Monday, Monday. And I remember just putting my head between my knees, brother, and crying, because I realized that the world had changed and I was going to be a part of it, my man. Yeah. So from there, Spanky and our gang, uh, the Pips, every, everybody. I mean, I, as you say, and again, I'm, I feel like an old man when I say this, but brilliant, vibrant, vibrant uh, music of the time. So... <laughs> So yeah, I listened to a lot of folks. I didn't see a lot of folks in concert, oddly enough, because I started getting busy doing it. But now, did you did you go to any particular record stores, or did you listen to any particular radio stations? When I got up here, <clears throat> of, of course, uh, N.A.W. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, PL, P- PLJ. PLJ ninety five point five. Yeah, right, FM. right, yeah. yeah. But as I say, uh, and this could be one of those wacky things that uh, it's like, oh, oh, you know, okay, Jim, sure, sure, man. Uh, 
it's really easy to steal stuff, Richard, <laughs> and you don't know you're doing it. That's that's the shtick. So I was always a little nervous about uh, about listening to a lot of radio, and a lot of my friends say, Dawson, you're crazy. You should have been listening 24 hours a day. Uh, simply to, this is another golden corn, Richard, uh, simply to keep my brain as clear as I could so that what came out of me was was me. It was organically grown. Yes, exactly, you know, for sure. Well, uh, when I was in the good earth, when I, when I, when I first came up here, uh, uh, freezing my ass, <laughs> uh, I, I got into a group called uh, the good earth, and uh, I kind of got into that group because uh, while I had done one or two like solo open mics in the village, you know, I, I, I wasn't catching on fire, so to speak. So I, I got into this group uh, that had uh, Bill Swap in it. Uh, God rest Bill Soul. And we were great. Uh, we were like totally different people. It's amazing we lasted as long as we did as, as, as a group. But through the Good Earth, uh, we started. Uh, they were signed to Dyna Voice, which was Bob Crew's label. Bob Crew, the infamous God rest your soul, brother, uh, the infamous producer of the Four Seasons and uh, and uh, Petula and Ben 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 Ben. Uh, so we started making records. So I, I found myself, gee, I'm, I'm in a recording studio, and uh, that's a pretty famous guy in there. And while I, I, I wasn't, like, <laughs> necessarily pleased with uh, what Bob was coming up for us, uh, it was still a wonderful experience. But through them, gee, uh, the, the infamous concert up at Fordham with the Association, I, I tried to play a clarinet part, and it squeaked. <laughs> okay, you know the clarinet. Eh, yeah, yeah. Right, and of course the audience laughed. Uh, but Judy Collins, never forget the date she broke a string at the very end of her show and uh, did an acapella tune. And I thought, holy sh, that's that's good stuff. Ian and Sylvia, I mean, everybody, Richard, I have worked with everybody. A lot of comedians. Uh, uh, Klein, I loved uh, Robert Klein. Uh, Crystal, we worked together a few times. Uh, uh, Ed Bluestone, uh, whatever happened to you, Ed? One of the funniest guys in the world. Uh, you know, he described himself, Richard, as a quatrosexual, and I said, "What's that?" <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I've exactly, interviewed Dr. Ruth, so I don't. I don't exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what I said. And Ed, with this deadpan face. Uh, Reminded me a lot of Gleason, of, uh, of uh, Gleason's uh, great physical comedy. Ed looks at me and says, anything for a quarter. <laughs> 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 so, so, so during all this time, at this time, were you writing music? And were you, where were you writing it? And how were you, you know, like, because you're saying like the songs come to you. I think like, I think Paul McCartney said like, you know, you, pull the songs out of the air. They're already there. You just have to pull them out of the air. Kind of. So how, what was your songwriting process? Well, if, if, if we could, you know, if, if we could come up with a, with a, you know, mathematical theory of, of that, it would it really be helpful. It, it's sometimes it was both Richard. Sometimes, uh, sometimes a line would, would, would come to me, uh, Steffi was the was a woman with the wrong kind of story, and and sometimes the line would suggest what the music wanted to be, and sometimes it was the other way around. Sometimes the music would suggest, and you know, I would you know, I would you know, I would have a. I'd smoke some pot. I'd sit in my little studio down on the on the, uh, Second Avenue, Thirty First Street, and I, you know I'd just start playing. In an odd way, I guess I'm still I guess I'm still doing it uh, that way. There are lots of people out there that say nonsense. You should go into the office at two o'clock and write until six every day. 
and I, I just I kind of never could do that. So as as I started to write, there's such a wonderful feeling, Richard, when you play in front of an audience, when you play a song for the first time. Again, I'm going to get really corny here, okay? We like corny. Uh, the show is built on corny. <laughs> it's sponsored by corny. <laughs> there's such a wonderful feeling when you do that because... The moment that you do that, the song is born. It's free. Okay. It's it's born. It it stands on its own. It 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 either it either it runs the race the way it's gonna run the race. I I I never do a song on stage the same way twice. I've been killed for that uh, because. It's the song shtick. I'm just the one singing the singing it and 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 playing it. So writing became for me. Uh, uh, it w- it was a way that I kept from shooting up the shopping mall, Richard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, and kind of in a strange way, this new tune. Uh, I haven't written much. If if anything. Richard, uh, since the last presidential election, any anything that I've written has been really negative, really really angry, and while there are times where, from a musical standpoint, that's okay, there are. There are other times when it's not. So uh, I just found myself in, a, in in kind of a, a silent stuff period. And so three, four weeks ago, my esteemed, who we need to talk about, a genius musical partner who shares my apartment with his wife and me, I'd like to kill them, Richard. <laughs> 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 Sat down at the keys and... Uh, started playing a pattern, and as I have mentioned, it was as if the song, the song, Richard, said, uh, okay, dude, do you want to get off your ass now and write me? And I, it, 14 or 15 drafts later, it turned into what it turned into, which as far as I'm concerned is... Uh, perhaps the best song uh, I've ever written, Seth, Seth's ever written, and it's totally simple, dude. It's like it, this ain't Rhapsody in Blue. This is simply an affirmation directed at the Statue of Liberty, whose picture we will never forget on nine eleven. It is an ode to her, and therefore, my brother an ode to us. And so I think I've come out of this writing slump, as I said to Walter, I have not been away. I have only been in a slump. (laughs) Uh, I think I've come out of it. So writing for me has been this, I'm still growing, my brother. Well, that's good. I suppose when I drop dead, my growth will be fini, okay? Or it'll be a whole different growth. <laughs> well, hopefully, you know, it's long into the future. <laughs> we, I'll give you another five, Richard. <laughs> many more, many more than five. Yeah, uh, we have, no, 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 I'm talking dollars. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh I, I, I'm talking years. You know. Handsomely pay you. You're up to ten. There we go. Uh, we have two minutes left. When... When you write now, or when you record now, technically and technologically, how does that differ from all those years ago? Is it easier because there's much more equipment, or is it harder because there's too much equipment? Or is it both? On, on one hand, it's, it's easier. Uh, I remember the first time we went from uh, <clears throat> reel to reel to digital, uh, I actually said aloud, oh, you don't have to rewind. Uh, on on one hand, it's it's easier. I, I get nervous because you can uh, you can start to get enthralled 
with the idea of perfection. Oh, wait a minute, uh, the guitar is a zillionth of a beat behind there. Poof, let's move it, okay? So, but, but I love it. Uh, my issue with recording is completely between my left ear and my right ear, and uh, <clears throat> I... I have to get back to it. I've probably got, no kidding, brother, I've probably got three 14-song records that need to be made. Wow. Yeah. So our our studio at the time being is like <clears throat> quite down, trying to figure out how to upgrade and need to be able to sit down and, you know, in, in, my, in my robe at two in the morning and, you know, start this process. I, I promise anybody who's listening, don't give up. Don't give up. Well, what's interesting is maybe you want to talk to the people at my father's place because we got all kinds of great, great sound and recording devices, and maybe we could, you know, get okay. some of the stuff, you know, get from your hard drive in your head to our hard drives, and then, and then out to your fans out there. <laughs> okay, all right, that sounds, sounds like a plan. All right, yeah. so now that we've settled world peace, we do need to take a quick break. <laughs> Richard Let's Solomon, go on to world hunger, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. J- Jim Dawson, jimdawson.com will be right back. You're listening to a podcast from LIU Studios. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to this show on your podcast app of choice. For more of our programs or to support LIU Studios, visit wcwp.org. Hey, this is Jeff Madsen of Dark Star Orchestra, and you're listening to Richard Solomon on WCWP 88.1 FM. Richard Solomon on the air, My Father's Place Radio. Also, we also co-production with Taking Care of Business and Out of the Question, but go to thesolomonchannel.com for all of our radio show content. Myfathersplace.com for My Father's Place Radio, and Jim Dawson, our guest this week, uh, jimdawson.com, and a... Legendary musician uh, from My Father's Place 1 and My Father's Place 2.0. And so, so one of the things I want to tackle in this, this section of the show is, you know, I always like to ask questions that I think people would like to know, or, you know, behind the scenes. And that's what our theme is here about getting to know, you know, a little bit in depth some of the artists that we don't really, you know, get to get the real deal from because on stage you're singing songs and, you know, everybody's appreciating the music, but sometimes want to get like a little deeper. What what do your fans generally ask you, and what do you want them to know that that's important for you for them to know? Well, it's 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 not as if they just you know come right out and you know ask uh, this next point, but uh, you know I do hear it secondhand and. You know, people come up and say, you know, my God, you should be playing at, uh, you know, Carnegie Hall and blah, blah, blah. So I, I think sometimes that, 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 I think sometimes that they think it's, it's, it's too bad that I'm not a household name, that I'm not like madly famous, okay? And we've had a wonderful run. When I lost The Tonight Show, at that point in time, somebody should have said, Jim, move to L.A. or London. Uh, it was bitterly disappointing because I was... Uh, you did The Tonight Show in those days with the legendary Johnny Carson, a good Nebraska boy next door to Colorado. You did it, that was it. You were kind of there. And uh, so when we lost that, it, it, it really hurt for the people and, that don't know the story, because we we did this in pre-production, you were scheduled to be on the Tonight Show, and what happened? I was because <laughs> they was need playing, to know the backstory. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, I was playing Chicago, I uh, with Bobby Bear, and Richard Nixon was uh, <clears throat> definitely in uh, grievous uh, trouble and was nearing the end of his presidency, which everyone by then had realized that he either had to resign or he was going to be impeached. And uh, who wants to be impeached, right? Wink, wink. Uh, So Richard Nixon resigned. I remember sitting 
sitting in my, my, my hotel room on the lake and, and, and watching Nixon resign. And I, I remember saying, you couldn't have waited. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't have waited. Could have hung out another week. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to... I, I, I had to go work, and that was one of the weirdest uh, uh, nights of my life. Bobby Bear, wonderful a friend of mine, was in his band. Danny Danny Flowers wrote some Nashville hits later on. Uh, that was a weird night uh, because I was thinking, I know what's going to happen. Management's going to call tomorrow and say that since the world has been canceled, so is Johnny Carson. So don't bother to fly to California. Fly home. <laughs> and I had I had charts, Richard. Uh, Doc Doc's band was going to kick ass on Simple Song, and uh, and I think Stephanie. Uh, and sure enough, the next day the phone rings and it's New York, and uh, yo, uh, lots of cancellations. Blah 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 blah. Come home. We'll try to get it rescheduled. Getting scheduled on the Tonight Show at that time was like <clears throat> impossible, and so it became that it became impossible to get rescheduled. So, okay, so yes, it bitterly hurt. Yes, it it slammed the brakes on 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 my quote uh, success, my commercial fame, uh, and it hurt, but I got over it. Uh, you go on. You accept the assignment. You you you, you accept it. Yeah. Look. And I, I think it's out of your hands. Yeah. Right. It's at, at, absolutely, Richard. And I, I think sometimes that wasn't in I, your assignment package. Yeah. I mean, you know, guys, gals, you know, c c come to a gig. It's better now than it was then, if you ask me. <laughs> uh, so, you know, so, so don't cry for me, Argentina. How's that? Okay. There you go. Yeah. But, but so in keeping with the theme, success is, is a metric that's measured in many different ways. Yes. You know, if you, you know, in, in certain spiritual pursuits, they say that if you could change one life, you've changed the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that some of your music has touched some people very significantly. And some of the stories, my brother, <clears throat> that I've been told <clears throat> in the old days via letter or uh, mostly via, via letter are like a couple had a young baby that was uh, that was very ill and and wasn't going to survive. And the only time the kids seemed at peace and at rest was when they were playing Simple Song. So, dude, after that, it's all downhill, you know? That must be, do you, do you, have you saved all of those really very significant communications? Nah. <laughs> nah. nah. <laughs> if you saw where I lived, Richard, you would suggest I throw out my cats. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, but uh, but I would want. I'm just so madly grateful for the support. X number of people, maybe not as X squared as we all might like, but X number of people get what I do and understand it and find comfort in it and find strength in it. Again, you know, I I rest my case. Well, the good know. news is you don't need bodyguards everywhere you go, and you know you can actually go to a store. <laughs> And buy things. Um, no, it's nonsense, funny. Richard. <laughs> you just can't see them. <laughs> but what's, what's sort of interesting, I, I, I kind of know somebody who's like very famous in somewhere in Long Island. And I met them at a supermarket. And it was like late at night. And it was one of those things where they almost looked like they were like breaking into a house. They were just kind of like, you know, it was like, wow, we're out. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I saw that there is a very big price to fame. And you can't just go out in your robe, you know, and throw out the garbage. You can't just, you know, wear a, a ripped T-shirt and go down to the local diner and have, like, coffee and breakfast and have nobody really care. 
and it won't become a news article. Right, exactly. <laughs> with, with cheap accusations, you were in the supermarket to pick up one of the, you know, stock boys, you know, something like that. I remember, uh, God, it would have been 72, 3, something like that. As I mentioned, I lived on the Lower East Side. And, you know, I was starting to have like a, like a, like a nickel in my pocket, so I, I was trying to go from... Uh, gee, I really did dress like a starving artist uh, to like sort of upgrading some of my wardrobe, so to speak. And there was this ever so hip clothing store around the corner on Third Ave. Okay, and the dressing rooms were like those saloon kind of doors, you know, those those you know uh, swinging kind yeah, of yeah, doors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had selected a a pair of jeans. Okay, <laughs> so I'm and these the dressing rooms. They had like two on one side and two on the other, and they were like facing each other, okay? But you had these like kind of half doors, like saloon doors, okay? And I remember I, I'm out of my pants. I got a leg in the pants I'm trying on, okay? And I look over, and there's this guy across the way with this really intense look on his face. He's trying on something, and he says, "You're Jim Dawson." <laughs> <laughs> and I found, I found it so funny. <laughs> so you're right, uh, Justin Bieber. No, baby, stay with us. Don't kill yourself. Don't OD. All the above. But how they put up with that is astonishing. Yes, well, I can. Th- I can th- go to Fairway and only quibble with the other old people. <laughs> well, no, you know, it's funny. I, I see. I actually, because of my association as a lawyer and, and with my father's place and some other things, I've actually seen the inconvenience of fame. Yes, fame is great and it brings a lot of things, but there is there is a price, you know, of, of privacy and just yep. you know. I mean, you, if you look at like all those papers in the supermarket of. You know, celebrities yeah. on the beach, and they make remarks about how they're a you little know. chunky. <laughs> yeah, no, and, you know, you know, God forbid you eat some bad food and have food poisoning, they're going to say you were puking because you were drunk. That's right, you know, or you, you know, or, you know, or just whatever. And, yeah. and, and and if you deny it, then that means people say, ah, yeah, you know. And it's just, <laughs> that means it's true. It's got to be true, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so if you lived in either London or Los Angeles, do you think your music would have been any different? Kind of no. But okay, that, that's a good answer. No, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, you said that you those know. were choices. I wonder if those would have changed any direction or... I, I, I suppose if I had uh, gone off to L.A., I, I, I might have gotten involved in the, uh, for, for lack of a better word, the, the sort of Eagles uh, approach. And I, you know, that that would have been okay, okay with me. But you know, could I have written, you know, your lion eyes? I uh, I don't think so. Uh, and London might might have been a whole different tale, but uh, I'll I'll never know. So so, what do you think it is about New York that gives you sustenance as a musician? As we all say, Richard, you can't live here, and you can't not. <laughs> uh, uh, nobody beats the Van Wick. <laughs> I believe that was that was a quote from Seinfeld. Well, I know one of my friends from Germany had to come through town a couple of weeks ago and uh, to, to help his father out up, uh, up in Connecticut, and uh, he had a nightmare experience at the car rental place. Okay, and then he simply said. In the flattest tone ever, he said, and then I hit the Van Wick. (laughs) (laughs) So I said exactly what you said to me. Jeff, nobody beats the Van Wick. (laughs) So I was upstate New York. I I believe I was near Kingston or Poughkeepsie, and there is a Van Wick Museum. And what? Yeah, there is because because Van Wyck was like a mayor of New York or something like that. I think his name was yeah, like yeah, Van yeah. Wyck is I think the the right way to say it or something like that or the yeah. the proper Van Wyck. Yeah, I think. Right. Yeah. So so I I I, I forgot who I was with. But I think it was maybe my brother. And I said, "Do me a favor, hold this." It was like a movie camera, 
And I'm knocking on the door and I'm going, why is there so much traffic? <laughs> it's like way before YouTube. Brutal. Yeah, absolutely brutal. And, I love that Seinfeld episode but, with uh, What's Your Name saying, and then I hit the Van Wick. Because, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, like, like, you know, it, it's a bright and brilliant city, but it's a tough city, too. It's a tough city, and the... Again, you know, forgive me if I if I start to get corny here. It it, it is it not uh, uh, among the centers of the world, and I'm not talking about Wall Street, and I'm not I'm not I'm not talking it's about, about the whole thing. Yeah, yes. it, it, it's the whole schmear, and <clears throat> yeah, it's mean, it's brutal. Uh, and yet, uh, my neighbors would come to my defense. I would come to theirs and, and what this town went through, uh, after nine 11, the resiliency, the, uh, unbelievable courage, the community, this is New York and we all share that. So if my neighbor's black, if my neighbor's gay, if my neighbor's Muslim, if my neighbor's Jewish, if my I don't give a shit who my neighbor is, because they're just like me. And stuck on the Van Wyck. <laughs> and other than staying away from the Van Wyck, I, I will not bother them. I love this town. I'd I'd love to be, you know, in an economic situation where I could do like say three months a year in oh, I don't know, Jamaica. Uh, Jamaica Queens? I, I'm, 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 <laughs> I couldn't get to it in time. I left it right over the plate for you. Uh, you know, but, but but I can't. So so uh, I, I love this joint. I will die in this joint. Well, it's interesting you mentioned 9-11 because I was actually at the base of the World Trade Center during the attack. And when, what? Yeah, that's for another day. And I actually uh, did an interview with Mayor Ed Koch a number of years later. And we actually talked about 9-11 from our various perspectives. Uh, but yeah, I was actually at the, the base because uh, many of the New York State and city courts are right there. And Jeez, I, I, on September 11, 2001, I was emerging out of the subway at 838 um, uh, on Chambers and West Broadway. And holy, holy I was right man. there and I saw, and you know, what, what, and I say this a lot, what people don't realize is that what you saw on television was a two-dimensional event. Yep. What, what we saw on the ground was a four-dimensional yep. event of yep. you know, a very big field of vision, you know, as far as you could see, smell, uh, sounds, screaming, sirens, helicopter noises, uh, news helicopters, uh, incessant siren noises. Uh, rumbling, uh, stampede noises, just, you know, it, it's actually hard to describe. Um, I did was, you, my, my brother, as, as time moved forward, did you have uh, <clears throat> some emotional issues about what you'd experienced? I was lucky enough to be far enough away because I wasn't, you know, like, like the, the, I mean, I saw the people jumping, which was like an unbelievable thing to see. I was going to mention but, you know, I guess, I guess uh, we all, it was amazing how people just banded together. And yep. the shared experience that we all had uh, was nothing compared to the people who either were maimed or killed or the people who lost so much. So in, in many sense, I felt very fortunate that I was just a, a, a distant witness. Yeah. And I was in relative safety. Um, in comparison, but I want to leave the show on this note. So, yeah, okay, uh, but, okay. but it's so, powerful. Sorry. And look, yeah, you know, right. it, you know. But but our point was uh, about this crazy ass town. Uh, it's got guts, my brother. If you can make it here, <laughs> you can make it. <laughs> Please, you're welcome in my guest room. <laughs> All right. So, with that happy note, we are going to see Jim Dawson at my father's place. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, stay on because we're going to have a little post-production talk. But JimDawson.com for all out there. Go check him out at my father's place. And go check him out at all the other venues he's playing at. So we'll see you uh, next week. Thanks yeah, for listening. Richard, thank you so much, my brother. Thank you, Richard.